Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Prado Museum for another of our weekly sessions in English. This is a program that is made possible with the help of the American Friends of the Prado Museum. We are a nonprofit organization, and we work on a lot of different projects to help the Prado. Uh, so I encourage you to find out more about us and about what we do. And if you prefer to speak Spanish, you can always find our sister institution, the Fundación de Amigos del Museo del Prado, as well. And today I have the pleasure of being in the room with Jan Bruegel's Five Senses. And I say pleasure because it is absolutely a pleasure to stand here and take in these paintings. It is such a delight. And I think that you'll agree with me as we get closer to these paintings today. Um, there's so much to take in, but they are not just to be taken at face value. These are very complex, very clever, layered allegories. They have so many readings. So uh, we'll see how much we can get in in just the next few minutes here. Um, so the five senses are, are based on uh, a, a visual tradition where each sense is represented with a woman that is engaged in some sort of activity that is related to the sense that she's representing. And then she's surrounded by objects that are representative of that sense as well. So the entire series is of the five senses. And in this time, to talk about the five senses is also a visual way to represent an allegory for knowledge of the world around us. This is a way to talk about uh, the fact that everything that we see in the world, everything in the world is knowable and perceived through the senses. So with scientific knowledge and with our senses, we can understand the world around us, we can classify it, document it. And here we have hundreds and thousands of objects that are related to scientific knowledge, related to the sense of perception, the different senses, and today we're going to focus on, on just one, on the sense of sight. So we see here uh, that, well, I think the first thing actually, the first impression that I have when I stand here looking at this painting is that, um, you don't even know where to look because there's so much going on. This is at least what happens to me. Um, there's so much happening here that you're not even sure where to start. But once you let your eyes start meandering around and discovering different objects, then uh, you start to see what's, what's going on in this painting. And you can appreciate all of the detail, the minuscule detail, all of the attention paid to every little bit. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that is unimportant in this painting. It looks like the artist painted with the thinnest of brush strokes. He had to have used a magnifying glass sometimes. And so this is one of the things that I love about this painting, about all of these paintings, that they really pull you in and beg for this longer, closer look. But this is not just the work of Jan Bruegel. This is actually the result of a collaboration. This is both by, uh, this is a project of Jan Bruegel, but also done with the collaboration of Rubens. The two of them were friends. They were two of the greatest painters in Flanders at the time. Flanders being the region that's more or less today, uh, present day Belgium. And each of the artists worked on his specialty here. So Rubens, of course, worked on the human figure as the great history painter that he was. And Jan Bruegel, who specialized in miniature paintings and objects and animals and plants, prepared the rest of the scene. So here we're looking at an allegory of sight. And we know that we can identify this painting as the allegory of sight, first because we have the woman in the center of the painting. And she's looking at something on the table. Now, the visual tradition of the allegory of sight is uh, is normally of a woman looking into a mirror. And here, Bruegel has swapped out the mirror and substituted it with a painting. And the painting itself also talks to us about sight, because this is a painting of Jesus curing a blind man. And if we look around, we'll see that there are references to sight, to seeing, to vision everywhere. We have telescopes and lamps. Uh, 
There are glasses, reading glasses, magnifying glasses, references to water. Water is uh, also symbolic of the sense of sight. And a lot of scientific objects around. This again talks about the, this rationalist idea of how we can perceive the world and study it and classify it. And we also see dozens and dozens of paintings here represented. And paintings, of course, make us think about sight, but they also make us think about collecting, right? About art collecting and about galleries. And Bruegel has even included in the back here uh, this path that opens up to a gallery of painting. So we might also be thinking about art collecting and artistic appreciation here. Now it's commonplace for us to think that painting is such a critical piece of collecting in today's mind, but it hasn't always been that way. And I think that Bruegel is also talking about older forms of collecting in another part of the painting. On this side, we can see maybe uh, a, a more traditional form of collecting before painting was the most prized possession in a collector's possession. In all of the paintings that are represented, if we notice, they're of all different genres. There's also lots of sculptures. So all of these refer to artistic creation. And so here, Bruegel is trying to tell us how painting is one of the liberal arts. And we can think again about all of this art being intermingled with scientific objects, uh, raising its reputation, right? Thinking back of that idea from the Renaissance that the painter is no longer a craftsman, that he's an artist. We also have uh, two pairs of mothers and children here that give us a Christian moral message. We have this group here of Venus and Cupid. And then we can compare them with here, the Virgin and child, the Virgin and the baby Jesus. And both of them are representative of two different types of love. The Virgin and child are representative of um, a sacred kind of love, of the Christian love, love of thy neighbor, while Venus would have been representative of profane love, pagan love, romantic love. And if we look at her position, we can see what this kind of profane love is bringing her, which is melancholy. She's standing in this classic position of melancholy with a sad expression on her face. And the last level uh, of meaning here, the last layered reading, at least that we'll get to today, and of course there are more, is political allegory, because we can see here that we have a very prominent portrait of two people, right? Well, these two people are Isabel Clara Eugenia and the Archduke uh, Albert of Austria. And Isabel Clara Eugenia was the daughter of Philip II, and she and her husband were sent to the Netherlands uh, to govern on the king's behalf. And when they were there, they were surrounded by Protestant kingdoms, and they, it was really sort of the beacon of the Counter-Reformation in Northern Europe. And they were important patrons of art. We can see a, their palace that's in the background here as well. So this painting is a tribute to the archdukes as generous rulers who were protecting the faith and also uh, bringing splendor and arts and progress back to Flanders. It is a complex, a layered allegory with so many meanings, with so many different readings that we've only touched on just a few of them today. And if you'd like to hear more about it, then I do encourage you to find uh, these paintings on our website and you can find commentary both by Alejandro Vergara and Teresa Posada. And uh, there's such a delight to look at. So, I also encourage you, if you can come to the museum, to find your way up to the second floor to see them for yourself. So with that, we'll conclude for today, and we'll see you again next Wednesday.